Greetings everyone, Brett here with Hammerhead Model Making, and I have got another long episode for you today. We are going to be looking at the ICM B26K Counter Invader. This is a kit that I've, well, I should say this is an aircraft that I've wanted to build for a very long time, but there was never any proper good kits for this version of the A26 slash B26. And... I had built a couple of the like old monogram Ravel A26s, but in order to do the conversion to a proper B26K, you had to buy a lot of resin stuff and do a lot of modifications to the kit, and my skills just weren't there. So when ICM started releasing their A26 um, series of aircraft in 148 scale, I you know it was just one of those things where I was like I just kept hoping and hoping that they were going to release the K. I'm sure enough they did. And so one of the things that I wanted to do with this kit, not only just because I was excited to build an A20 or a B26K, but I wanted to create a very specific, recreate a very specific image that I had in my head of, of the B26K. And so as I was doing research up for the, the B26, I stumbled across a picture um, of a B26, it kind of, you know, sitting on the the Marzen matting in Southeast Asia, one of the engines was, all the covers were pulled off, there was this big scaffold thing next to it, and I just I just really liked that look. So that was, that was what I set out to create. And upon opening the ICM kit, it was kind of like a, it was both a happy and sad moment. I, I, I was really happy that I was being able, to, I was able to build this kit, that we had a good solid kit in 48 scale, it was modern, that was dedicated to the actual B26K, but um, it was kind of sparse on the details, especially on the interior. And so I decided, okay, well, this is gonna be a good time to practice all of my scratch building. And so really what I had designed or um, set out to do was to detail as much the interior of the aircraft because I wanted all the doors, hatches, you know, things open so you could see as much into the aircraft as possible. And so I started with the back compartment. On the B-26K, this was known as the observer's compartment. And they had a lot of equipment back there. Uh, oftentimes the B-26s would have like a large camera pack inside the bomb bay. And so the observer could operate the cameras from back there. He had other equipment in there. And there was both a small door on the side of the fuselage and a hatch in the canopy above. And I wanted to open both of those and add as much detail as possible. So basically for like the next 30 or some odd minutes, it's this is really gonna be me showing you how how I do a lot of the scratch building. Most of my scratch building is going to be done with evergreen styrene of various shapes, thicknesses, diameters, and and lengths. And and as in terms of finding reference material, uh, because I do get off, I do get asked often, you know, like, how do you how do you know what to add or what's not there? And and really, it's just a matter of pouring through dozens hundreds of pictures trying to find you know very specific images of what you're looking for in terms of like the interior exterior stuff there was actually a few videos online of the restored special k which is the only b26k currently in flying condition uh, there was a few walk around videos that i found that were extremely helpful because they showed a lot of areas that picture you can't find pictures of so I was able to use those and just, you know, basically watch the, sh watch the movie for, or the video for a little bit, pause it, take a screen grab, watch it, pause it, take a screen grab of all, from a bunch of areas that I, I wanted to detail and recreate. And so that's largely what a lot of this is. And I don't want to sound like I'm being overly negative on the ICM kit because in reality, the ICM kit is a really nice kit and the detail that it has is not necessarily incorrect it's just it could have more detail so that's really what i'm doing is just doing a lot of adding detail as opposed to like changing or removing it um so overall the kit is really nice it goes together well it fits together well uh but like i said it just needs a little a little help if especially if you're doing 
everything open. If you know, if you didn't, if you weren't going to do everything open, you're just going to have everything closed, which is basically how the kit is designed to be made. Um, it, it would be fine. You would, it would be passable. You really wouldn't be able to see a lot, but I have wanted to do it differently. So what you're seeing is just me adding small details to the observation compartment. A lot of it is structural, so adding ribs, adding other elements that aren't in the kit. There are some additional um, equipment things on this, this back bulkhead here that I am adding. And um, another thing that I am doing with this kit is I am using a set of 3D decals, which I have not used before. And I had seen people using them on other stuff, and I thought, like, wow, those really looked really looked good. And so I decided to pull the trigger on this, and I was able to get a good deal on some 3D decals through my local hobby shop. And so I was like, I, I just decided, let's go and do it. So, for example, what you see here is I've I've replaced the face of what should be like a bunch of like radio equipment and other various equipment pieces with just flat sheets, and that's because I've I wanted I'm going to be replacing the detail that goes on there with the 3D decals. And it was just easier to replace the front with a piece of plastic than to sand off the, the raised detail that was there. And it was just, just worked out easier this way. So that's what I'm doing there. Uh, you can see some putty on the floor of that compartment there. That's because for there were a few odd design choices in this kit. One of them being the floor is two parts. And so it's got a big gap right in the middle. And so that needed to be filled and, and cleaned up. Um, I'm adding wiring to the interior as well using the the lead wire you just saw there as well as some floral wire of various thicknesses and diameters. The nice thing about the lead wire is that because it's so soft, it's really easy to get it to conform around different things and shapes and objects. So it's, it's pretty ideal even if it's slightly overscaled a little bit. I don't mind it being out of, you know, overscale. I, I'd rather be able to see the detail than to have it be in properly in scale. Um, I would say as far as the interior, the weakest part of the interior are the seats. The uh, The rear seat here in the observation compartment was just, just literally this L-shaped piece of plastic that sits on a single post in the center and then sits in the center of the compartment. In reality, the seat was actually offset to the side because it was supposed to, it, the uh, operator was supposed to be able to be sitting directly in front of the camera equipment and in reality the seat had a much more complex um, frame to it and so I'm just using little bits of you know styrene rod and styrene sheet here to reproduce to some degree of accuracy the the frame that actually the seat sits on it's not going to be a hundred percent accurate again because I was it, it was difficult finding really good reference pictures for some of this stuff but it's going to look much better than the actual kit seat would have looked. And so this is really just, I, I mean, I, I used to remember feeling really intimidated by doing scratch building work, but I realized that once I just started doing it, it really wasn't that difficult. It just, it just takes time, right? Cause I have to, I'll have to do a little bit of work, glue it, wait for the glue to dry and set then do a little bit more work wait for the glue to dry and set and I can do a little bit more work so it's, it helps to have multiple little projects going on at once so that you can um, you know you're not you're not just sitting around waiting so here you can just see how the, the seats gonna look inside the compartment uh, much better than just that single peg in the middle uh, another thing that the another area that the ICM kit is kind of lacking in is the large recess where the wing sits uh, in the bomb bay in reality it was it was pretty much you know sealed up and so in order to make it look better i used some tape to create a template that i could then transcribe onto a piece of plastic that will now you know that will fill in that uh that indentation there where the wing root is and there are two bulkheads, actually technically three bulkheads that you have to worry about. Uh, one right in the center, so the, the front bulkhead, which is also the aft end of the cockpit, that's your first, your front wing spar. Then there's a bulkhead in the center of the bomb bay, that's your aft wing spar. And then the back bulkhead is the, is the divider between the bomb bay and the observer's compartment. So now I have to um, replace or add 
the missing rib and stringer detail in here. So I'm just using some strip styrene. It's not doesn't quite match up to the the width of the ribs and stringers in the, on the actual kit, but it's close enough. And there's going to be other stuff over it that you're really not going to notice. And my local hobby shop didn't have anything thinner than this, so this is just what I had to use. But it's just going around, making sure everything's lined up, getting it trimmed, and getting it added on. And I wasn't necessarily super concerned about getting this super accurate just because I knew that there would be a lot more stuff going into the Bombay and that you'd really only be viewing it from the bottom and so as long as it just it looked the part I was happy and just like I said it's not difficult work you just you just got to take your time so there we got both halves and uh, additional detail I wanted to add to the inside roof so this is this part sits on top of the this is like the the top part of the aircraft um, that circle part there is where a turret used to be. So because these were converted from World War II era stock, there used to be a turret up there, but they no longer needed the defensive turret for this particular role. And so it was deleted and blanked over. Here I'm just adding a little bit of detail to the, uh, the bomb racks and the, you know, the, the, re the release shackles where the bombs would be attached. The B-26K could carry an internal bomb load in addition to the external bombs, you know, or, uh, munition stores that it had. But oftentimes the, the crews would use the bomb bay to store either an auxiliary fuel tank, which you'll see later on, and camera equipment, some, sometimes camera equipment. Um, so speaking of the auxiliary fuel tank, I wanted to try my hand at building one. And at first I had considered maybe trying to model one in 3D and, and print it out, but my 3D modeling skills are just are still really, really basic. And I just felt like it was kind of out of my, my league as it were. So I took a little piece of balsa wood, cut it and sanded it down to kind of create this little puck and then basically laminate plastic over it using super glue. And I think this ended up working out for the better because the fuel tank wasn't necessarily like a very rigid thing and so I didn't need to worry about getting everything all like perfect and square uh, really just to kind of have the, the overall shape here so now I'm just going to laminate some some pieces of plastic onto the sides and this is really thin plastic by the way uh, I mean not much thicker than than paper so it's it's easy to manipulate it's easy to cut uh, just cutting it with scissors here and makes it a lot easier to work with. So now what I'm doing is I'm replicating the straps that kind of helped create the structure and rigidity for the the fuel tank here. And, it, and really it's just kind of a matter of taking really basic geometric shapes, rectangles, squares, things like that, and, and kind of layering up to build what I need. And, and again, I, I, I only had really one reference picture of what the fuel tank was supposed to look like. So I hope I get this pretty close because I can. I really only could see it directly from like below looking up. So, uh, you know, there could be a lot of detail on the sides that I'm not getting right. But here, just using a little bit of spare photo etch to to uh, make it look nice. And this is basically how it's going to fit. So it fits into the front section of the bomb bay, and it, eventually there will be a pipe that connects it to to the aircraft. But. Here I'm just adding some rivet detail to the Bombay doors. Uh, from the pictures that I saw, the rivets were quite prominent on the Bombay doors. So I wanted to make sure I, I got that replicated as well as drilling out these little air scoops that were on it. I believe the air scoops were used to help cool the camera equipment, but I could be wrong. But these little, these plates that I have that I riveted, those could be removed and replaced with glass for the actual camera system. They would look straight down through the bottom of the bomb bay. Uh, this is the bulkhead that separates the bomb bay and the cockpit. So this is this this would be the side that's facing into the bomb bay, and there was a bunch of hydraulic details that were, that go into here. So I tried to replicate it as best I can. It's, this is actually much simpler than how it actually looks because it, it's very complex. Lots of pipes. Lots of uh, fittings in there for the hydraulic system. So I did my best to replicate that. As I mentioned before, I wanted to open everything up and that meant the extremely scary task of trying to cut open 
the main canopy. And this was just kind of one of those one of those moments where I, I had to psych myself up to make that very first cut because I knew once I made that first cut, I was committed. I didn't have a replacement. I mean, I probably could have requested one, but um, yeah, it was it was terrifying. I just had to go really slow because that so the yellow strip of tape tape in the tape in the middle that's all that you know that has to support that canopy there so i had to be really careful not to break it so here i'm just getting everything masked up i actually had two sets of these masks so i was able to kind of jury rig some of them to work on the inside of the clear part so i was able to actually spray the insides as well as the outsides so that was really nice and handy to have so these are from kitmask.com uh, highly recommend you check them out for masking needs. But basically, we just go around and, and get these uh, these canopy masks applied. And pretty straightforward. These fit great. I had no issues with them. Easy to apply. And they, they were like steadfast throughout the entire build. Never had to worry about paint bleed or them moving around. As I mentioned before, these are the 3D decals. And as such, you do have to remove some detail from the kit parts, like the instrument panel here. So I had to do a lot of sanding and grinding to get rid of the raised detail, which in all fairness to ICM was actually really nice. But the 3D decals are just going to be slightly that much more better. Putting together the cockpit was pretty straightforward. And I didn't have to do as much modifications in the cockpit here, just because the 3D decals were really going to cover a lot of the the modifications as it were that would have ne needed to be made uh, had i not been using the 3d decals you do have to remove this little connection point here that's where the seat is like the co-pilot seat and the pilot seat again there's the way that they're structured set up is they basically sit on this little box which is not correct so that's why those were removed just adding a little bit of rivets to the floor um the f the cockpit floor acts as the roof to the nose wheel well and so there was a lot of rivets coming in, in up and down between the cockpit floor and the nose wheel well. Additionally, just adding some uh, a little bit of wiring detail here. There wasn't a whole lot that I felt that I needed to add, or at least that I, that I could see that I needed to add. But so just like the observer seat, uh, I decided I needed to spruce up the pilot and co-pilot seat including adding some cushions using some two-part epoxy um, putty and so this this just gets it's basically you know two parts you have a, a light gray and a dark gray you mix them together it creates a medium gray color and here are the finished seats all detailed up looking pretty good and oh another thing with uh, so the, a lot of modifications were made to the A26 airframes for it to become the B26K. One of the things that ICM didn't reproduce well is the control column. It the kit has the old World War II style control column, whereas the actual B26Ks had a different control column. So I had to get that made. Now we can move on to painting the interior. For this, I'm using Alclad's gloss black base, and I've really I've really been liking using this gloss black base as a primer, not just for metallics, but kind of for everything. Um, in this particular case, it, it will work basically as both because I will be doing a metallic undercoat for everything since I'll be doing a lot of chipping. So it does work for that, but just in general, I've really been liking using this as a, as a, a basing color. So here you can see priming the inside of the clear parts. Um, this is not something I do often to, to actually paint the inside of the clear part. Normally I just do, you know, you paint the interior color from the outside kind of a thing. But because I was going to have so much stuff open, I really felt it was going to be necessary for this. So now we're just laying down our metallic coat using some Alclad aluminum. And this will serve as the base for chipping. One of the things that I've noticed is with a lot of World War II aircraft that were used post-war, they the Air Force tended to paint over the interior green colors with black. So we're basically going to be doing a three-layer chipping effect here, starting with the aluminum color. So I'm applying some of this uh, masking fluid. 
with a sponge just to, to random areas of the interior. And I will leave this on as I paint the next color so that that way it'll, you know, I'll be able to chip down to that aluminum color. So for, for the next color, we're using Interior Green by Ammo Mig. And so everything, all pretty much all of the interior parts get a coat of this. There are a few areas that I noticed didn't have interior green chipping, at least in the reference pictures that I saw. And, and it's possible that this varied from, from aircraft to aircraft, but for the most part, most of the interior had the interior green chipping or the interior green paint. And then what's gonna happen is I'll do another layer of the masking putty or the masking fluid with the sponge and then i will move on to the next color so here we're just finally finalizing that interior green color and now we're moving to the next so this is this is nato black and this is going again like i said this is going on over another layer of the chipping fluid or, or sorry the the masking fluid and going on in a nice thin layer i didn't really want this going on heavy and I wanted a little bit of that green kind of showing through just to give the effect that, you know, maybe they were painted hastily or there's just, you know, there's been some wear. So I wasn't going full coverage on this, which is why I had it pretty thin. And go around and paint everything with the interior or with the natal black. So everything at this point gets this color that's on the inside of the aircraft. I also took advantage to paint some other things off camera, but... Um, now we can start removing all of that masking fluid. So uh, I'm just using various sponges and essentially eraser pieces to remove it to help, you know, bite that, that fluid and then pull it off. And you can see that lovely aluminum color underneath there. So like I mentioned before, so this is one of the areas where it, my reference pictures didn't show a lot of the interior green showing through. Um, but here you can see that nice, that nice two-tone effect in the uh, the Bombay there really happy with how it turned out it's probably a little bit overdone but it looks good to me so now we're just doing some detail painting using various colors this just happens to be a light gray painting some of the wiring and cabling in the in the Bombay as well as other places like in the observers room so here you can just you can see a lot of that that nice chipping showing through of both the aluminum and the interior green. It just kind of helps add a little bit of variety to what would otherwise be a very monotonous black color. And little focal points for you to focus on when looking at through through the windows. Painting the cushions on the pilot and co-pilot seat here. Uh, this is just using a khaki color. I'm sure they had different colors. This is just what I liked, looked what I thought looked good. And uh, this is just acrylic Vallejo paint. Can't forget some of the tiny details like the handle on the hatch to the observer's compartment. It's these little details I think really help kind of make things pop for the final, the final build. Uh, so now I'm going through and adding a little bit of an oil wash here, kind of a pin wash into some of the areas using a basically like a buff type color. It's just, it's really just brown and, and white mixed together, but this is just gonna help kind of give it a dusty, slightly dirty look um, it will dry a little bit darker than what it looks like wet so it will be a little bit more subdued in the, on the once it's actually dry but it'll still be noticeable enough that you know it'll it'll look good it'll look dusty and i don't normally use oil i i in the past i've usually used like an enamel washer to do this kind of stuff but i didn't have the right color that i wanted so i mixed it up with oils and in the end i'm happy with how it turned out so now we can start applying some of these 3D decals. Now these are technically decals, so you, you have to let them soak in water and then they will slide off the backing. And technically they are self-adhesive, uh, just like a normal decal would be. However, from reading comments online, I it's pretty much universally recommended that you should use a little bit of glue to secure them. So I'm just using some PVA glue, you know, just normal white Elmer's glue to secure these on. And I'm glad I did because once the glue dried, they they weren't going anywhere. Um, but I was surprised with how easy these were to apply and to, you know, you still have a little bit of time to move them around, get them into position. But, the, and you could, you could tell from putting that one on, it had a little bit of, um, you know, 
they're not rigid they're they're but they're much thicker than a normal a normal decal so they're they're really easy to apply and i think they they really give a good effect i i mean i'm gonna say probably better than like pre-colored photo etch and they didn't have they didn't quite have like the graininess that you kind of get from pre-colored photo etch sometimes so i was very pleased i would definitely use 3d decals again on another project not sure what project i want to use them on but the these get a high recommendation for me plus the uh the 3d decal set i'm using was very comprehensive um in terms of what it offered so one of the neat things is it gives you the soundproofing material that was that filled the interior of the cockpit as well as like all the little hat you know switches and levers and and handles that come that you would get from like a photo etch set uh they have it you know 3d printed decal and they they were these were a little bit more difficult to apply but in the end not that much more difficult than um photo etch and and i like that you don't really have to worry about like bending like if you had to bend this part for photo etch to get it over that that curve that would be kind of troublesome without ruining the photo etch so in the end i like them they they look really nice that these are the, the seat belts come with the photo or with the the 3d decals as well and they look great easy to apply and much more they drape much more naturally than photo etch does so these get high praises from me so at this point all of the interior is done and we can start getting it all assembled there's a lot of plastic going into this kit so you really have to be careful that everything is lined up where it should be and so that once it comes time to close the fuselage halves you're not left with any annoying gaps uh, here's some more of those 3d decals going on these ones are actually i didn't actually remove these from the backing i left them on the backing and just trimmed them out because i needed them to be rigid in order to box in the back half of the cockpit here so those ones i didn't apply them in the normal decal manner they're just tacked in there with super glue um, here we can fit in the observers compartment and there you can again you can see all the the instrument faces that were done with the 3d decals and just how nice they look all the buttons are there the switches are there they have a lot of relief from the uh, the surface unlike uh, photo etch so there's there's very much a good you know as the name supply implies a good 3d effect there very pleased with it really helps kind of make the the interior compartments feel nice and busy as they should so we can get the seats installed and there, it's a tight fit between the side walls and the center console but they they do fit and one of the things i like to do in situations like this is just to have a slight offset between the two seats because it just helps make it not feel perfect uh, the observer seat going in and uh, really kind of wraps up and completes that compartment really pleased with how that turned out and pleased that you'll be able to see into it easily enough through the the side hatch and the top canopy uh, we can get the control columns installed and that kind of wraps up mostly getting the uh the interior parts done. so this is that center uh, bulkhead spar that i mentioned earlier that gets put in there and uh, that's really it. Now we can get it all, all wrapped up. So here I'm just using some tape to largely secure the halves together so that it'll, it'll hold whilst I start doing gluing. And uh, this just helps keep everything in place so I can, I can glue little sections at a time and work my way around the aircraft. And I can, I can pull up tape as needed, get my glue applied, and then reapply the tape to get to, to let that hold so I can move on to the next section. Making sure to get glue in some of these hard to reach places that will be difficult later on because now we can start you know closing up all of the, the all the other spaces on the aircraft fuselage here. Like, like I mentioned before the fit is generally good you can you can see some of the areas where I had to do a little bit of sanding and blending and, and filling along the fuselage. Overall that it really didn't take me that long to, to do because the fit was generally pretty good. Rudder going on and as well as a lot of the other components. Another criticism I have of the ICM K 
kit is the nose. The kit nose is kind of this weird multi-part affair, but it's also too short. So I was able to find a replacement online and 3D printed it. And the 3D printed replacement is mostly a just drop on fit. Uh, here you can see I'm using the kit gun barrels and they fit flawlessly in the 3D printed part. You do have to remove these little circular objects on the side of the fuselage in order to get the 3D printed part to fit correctly, but the 3D printed part does come with replacements for those so that you don't lose that detail. And it's it's interesting because it's it's only longer by like three or four millimeters, but that extra three or four meter, millimeters actually makes a big difference and you can tell I, the, the, the difference in length. The gun barrels need to be drilled out. So here I'm using an old airbrush needle to kind of create a pilot hole, and then I can come in and drill those out. It's unfortunate they don't provide you with, you know, pre-drilled gun barrels. I think if I were to do this again, I would replace these with brass tubes because they did kind of present a, a little bit of a challenge throughout the painting process where I, I kept bumping them. I ended up bending one and had to carefully um, bend it back without breaking it. So like I said, I, I think I would replace these with aftermarket or brass barrels or brass tubes because they're technically they're blast tubes. It's not the actual gun barrel itself. Um, another nice thing about the this 3D printed replacement is because it's hollow, I was able to stuff it full of some tungsten weight um, as well as fishing weight because I really wanted to make sure that this thing wasn't going to be a tail sitter because it would just kind of just be unfortunate. It's always, it's always a sad thing when you have an aircraft be a tail sitter. So I loaded that thing up with tungsten weight as well as fishing weight. And even though it was really heavy, I just, I didn't want to take any chances. So the nose took a little bit of blending to get it all to, to line up properly, but it was really not that much trouble. Um, another unfortunate thing with the ICM kit is that it lacks the armor plate that's added on the pilot side of the aircraft. So there's, there's a bunch of armor plate that runs from the fuselage back to the observer's compartment. And while you might think that it's there to help protect the pilot's end or observer, it's actually designed to protect a lot of the flight controls and wiring and cabling that runs from the front end of the aircraft to the back end of the aircraft. And it's not necessarily very prominent and you probably wouldn't notice if you just weren't familiar with the aircraft, but it should be there, and so I'm just I, I wanted to recreate that using some really thin plastic, and uh, so it's just a matter of creating a template similar to how I did with the interior of the bomb bay, and cutting it out in plastic, and then getting it applied. It did have so the the, the armor because the armor did stick out from the fuselage of the aircraft. Um, the real thing had this. Uh, essentially if i understand correctly basically like a quarter inch round wooden fillet applied to it and so to try and replicate that i'm just using some of this vallejo plastic putty uh, this stuff is relatively benign to use it's not the best for like filling seams but it is good for filling joints like this so you apply it let it dry and then using a wet q-tip you can gently rub off the excess so that's what I'm attempting to do here all around the the armor plating there and to just kind of help blend it in a little bit. In the end, I'm happy with how it turned out. You honestly don't really notice it very much when you're looking at the aircraft, but I like to know that it's there. So now we with with the fuselage pretty much wrapped up, we can move on to the wings. The uh, the B26K kit differs greatly from the other earlier A26 kits in the wings. It has completely new parts for the wings because the wings had to be essentially like stripped down and rebuilt in real life. They needed huge strengthening strips added to them in order to uh, support the weight of all the ordnance on the wings. You do, oddly enough, you get separate control surfaces for the wings, but they're non-posable, especially the flaps. Uh, it's unfortunate that you can't pose the flaps. They without doing extensive modification to them. 
The ailerons you could easily do just re by removing the, the tab that it slots into the wing with, but it's, it's just, it's a shame. Um, another thing, the landing gear doors are molded into the uh, sidewall detail of the landing gear area, and I, I kind of foresaw that as being a pain to deal with during the painting process. So I carefully removed all the landing gear doors from the the parts that connected them to the interior of the landing gear or the landing gear wells so that I could paint them separately and not have to just deal with the hassle of masking them on the aircraft because I just knew that would be annoying. Um, we can start moving on to engine detail. So here we're just moving, putting on the air intake that sits above the engine. There is a rather prominent splitter in there. So I had to get that added with just some sheet plastic and uh, other than that, it's pretty straightforward. Now, here's where I'm going to give, I'm going to sing ICM's praise, you know, till the end of my days. They give you two full R2800 engines. And it's not just the fact they give you the full engine. It is it is the correct late, you know, style engine. So these these were these ones were more powerful than what you had in, like, the Corsairs and the, the Hellcats during World War II. Um, so they're 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 accurate to the correct style of R2800 engine, but it's when I say it's the full engine, you get the front all the way to the back. So it is extremely detailed, and it does really ICM has designed this to be displayed, and it's a, it would be a shame to cover these up. And so really, the only detailing that you need to add to these engines. Well, I shouldn't say the only. I mean, you could you could add infinite amount of detail to them, but you it, it needs the wiring, you know, all the ignition wires. Um, and because if you if you plan on doing this exposed, you know, the engine opened up, you're doing both the fronts and back um, ignition wires to each cylinder. So just remember that's 36 wires that you have to do, and uh, which means you got to do a lot of drilling because you got to drill the 36 you know, spark plug entry points to each cylinder, as well as all of the 36 points along the ignition harness. But I mean, so you get the full uh, reduction gear housing, you get the ignition ring, you get push rods for both, you know, both banks of cylinders, and you get uh, the full intake sets and exhaust sets for all the cylinders. It's, it is probably the best R2800 engine I've seen in plastic in 48 scale you know tell me in the comments if there's one better than this but this pretty much takes the cake so here I'm just working from the back cylinders forward adding in the ignition wires this is using floral wire so really what I'm doing here is just I've, I've cut a you know a set length of wire bending it around getting it close to where it needs to get in to the ignition harness and then I trim it and get it inserted. It's it's a slow process, and it it took a while to do both. Uh, you know because I am who I am, and I had to do both engines. So you know everything you're seeing here, double it up for a second engine that you don't see off screen. Um, but in the end, it just it lo it looks really good, and, and even even unpainted like this, it looks pretty good. So here we can get the back push rods installed for the, the back row and we can get the intakes. So this is the intakes for all the cylinders and it pretty much fits flawless. I had to, I had to adjust some of the wires here and there, but otherwise it fit pretty good. Then we get this piece put on. So this, this part here actually holds all of the cowl flaps and pretty important to get put on there. Um, the exhaust are all separate pieces, and in reality, the exhaust, the openings were somewhat oblong-shaped, kind of pill-shaped almost, but there's no way I was going to be able to replicate that at this scale, uh, so I'm just drilling out circular holes, but in the end, it's going to look infinitely better than just having, you know, kind of weird blank blobs of plastic. Again, this is one of those things, just like the gun barrels, it would have been nice if ICM could have provided some slide molding here to have these pre-drilled out because I can't tell you how many times I poked my fingers trying to drill these out because each engine has like eight pieces to install for the exhaust. 
Fortunately, they give you this handy little template that you slot onto the back of the engine and it gives you the perfect guide on where all of the exhaust, exhaust pieces go and how they're supposed to lay. So here you can just kind of see how they all have their little spot, spot to fit into. And once it dries, you remove the, you remove the template and move, you put it onto the other engine. So very nice. Um, there was a little bit of fit issue on the back side of the engine nacelles because you've basically got four different components all meeting together. So that required a fair amount of sanding and filling just to really get that all blended in nicely. That was, pro that was probably the worst fitting part of the whole kit in terms of like the fuselage and, and the exterior part was just the back end of those nacelles. But in the end, it really wasn't that difficult to get them put on. Um, so there I got the, the pylons installed and now I'm gonna add a few little details to the back of the engine nacelles. And I believe, and you can correct me if I'm wrong here in the comments, but I believe that these were, um, you know, pressure release for the fuel tanks and or uh, fuel dump but there's two of these things at the back of the engine nacelles and there's one each at the back of the tip tanks on the wings and again I believe they were used to you know equalize pressure inside the gas tanks as fuel was used in flight so make sure to get that's a pretty prominent detail uh, that ICM is missing here so make sure to get that added on and so that like I said two at the end of each nacelle and then one at the end of each tip tank so with the basic construction done we can move on to painting and again I am using the gloss black base by Alclad to prime everything going for a nice black base um, you, you will see that I actually do have some primer on there already that is Tamiya fine primer I was using that to spot check all of my sanding and filling seams so but Ultimately, I wanted the black as my as my actual base for painting, and uh, so I could use the black basing technique here. So it's just a matter of going around, getting everything primed up. Take your time, make sure your primer coat's going on. Um, you, you want it to go on thin enough, but you know, obviously, you want it to be covering plastic. So to do the mottle layer, I'm using some some of the white paint by Outlaw Paints. It's a company that's based out of Australia, and is this is a lacquer based paint but it sprays beautifully out of the bottle and was really a great foundation for doing my model layer. And uh, it's just a matter of going around, adding some randomness to all the panels, and now we can start doing some colors. So if you've watched my F105 video, I'm using the exact same color recipes from for that, that I used on the F105 for this. I was really pleased with how that SEA camo turned out. And, um, wanted to do it again on the counter invader here so looking at uh, both the instructions the you know the the color profile in, in the instructions as well as reference pictures and additionally video modern video of the restored special K um, I decided to freehand the camo here so, um, initially I left off the wings during the paint process I, it's just I find it's easier to get like in between in the nacelles and underneath and less having to do uh, masking. But in order to make sure the camo lined up correctly, I did have the wings temporarily um, slotted on just to make sure everything was lining up correctly. So now we can move on to our medium green color here. Um, and again, the I'm painting this relatively thin because I do want some of that white to show through to create some tonal variations in the overall paint. But uh, really just making sure that my demarcation between colors is pretty tight. So I'm, I'm, I'm really spraying it, spraying it a low pressure, um, small aperture to make sure that that's all looking pretty good. Once I kind of get the outlines defined, I can then go in with a you know larger spray pattern to kind of bulk it out. But really when dealing with those in-between colors, I wanted to make sure that that line was nice and tight. Um, again, temporarily fitted the wing on so I can make sure that the uh, camo pattern all lines up correctly you know going from that that wing to fuselage joint there and uh, getting clear parts and canopy parts painted up as well 
just a it, it's it's a time consuming process I, you know i wish i could say it was fast and easy but um i really ended up i probably did the the whole four tones so the the three tones on top plus the black underneath probably over a week's worth of time getting this painted up for the darker green i do a little bit of a mix here so i've got about a 80 20 mix of green to this kind of smoky gray color to create the much darker green that that's uh, that i'm using here um and and as just like on the f105 um the I, I just wasn't satisfied with the dark green color out of the bottle so had to make it a little bit dark but here we're just filling in all of the remaining areas on the upper side of the aircraft filling in and blocking out this color this color was a little bit harder to get thinned down properly and and you know have it be um, translucent enough to show some of that shading underneath so unfortunately it, it, it there were a couple areas where it went on pretty heavy um, but that was just that's more my fault than the paint's fault just getting that the correct ratios for for the thinning on this for the underside we're bringing back our NATO black and again just really wanted to be careful and get those tight demarcations between the colors I really like the SEA camo over a black bait or a black underside versus like a light gray underside. So on the F105, I had it over a light gray underside, and I really like the black. It just it's neat, and it, I don't know. It just kind of makes it look meaner, I guess, <laughs> if that's a thing. Um, and fortunately, the demarcation on the fuselage was pretty much straight, you know, front to back. Didn't have to worry about like waves or anything, which I always kind of struggle with making them making them look appropriately scaled so that was nice uh, here we can paint up some of the prop there paint up the prop tips in hindsight i did the yellow part too wide and it should be a little bit narrower but i still think it looks all right it looks good um there's a tiny little spot of white on the tail so i'm not exactly sure if that was um, cosmetic or if that served a purpose like if it was part of like a some kind of sensor or or radio or something but there it is uh, here we can remove some of uh, the uh, masking fluid off of the prop tips so you can show some of that lovely chipping underneath and uh, now we can move on to doing some detail painting throughout the aircraft so here I'm just painting up the ignition wires on the R2800 and so this is using a color called parasite brown um, great color. I use it for a lot of different purposes, um, and I'll actually use it two, two different for two different purposes on the engine here. The fir first purpose being painting the ignition wires. Um, you can see I've already done the gear reduction housing, painted that dark gray, given it a little bit of a wash. Now we can start painting the exhaust. So this I am using a flat earth color to paint the exhaust, and it was a little it was a little difficult trying to get in between the cylinder heads here. To, to reach these parts of the exhaust, but uh, again, if you're using a small brush, take your time, go slow, you can get it there. The rest of the uh, exhaust pieces were, were pretty simple to get painted at the back end. <clears throat> and then here we are using that Parasite Brown again, but this time really thinned down and almost applying it like a filter or a wash over the exhaust parts. And this will kind of help give it that, that rusty burnt look that the exhaust gets. Here we're gonna do a quick uh, dry brush over the gear reduction housing. Kind of let some of those, uh, all those bolts pop and be a little bit more prominent. Just kind of helps out a little bit of more, a little bit of weathering to it as well. We can get the cowl flaps applied at this point. Um, so the inside of the cowl flaps were painted interior green. The exterior parts are for now are just painted black. I will get them, um, I'll mask them off and paint them to match the camouflage pattern on the cell but because of the way that the cow flaps are done it was going to be too hard to paint them ahead of time uh to know you know where they needed to line up and 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 how they needed to fit on there so that's how the engine looks on the wing so at this point most of the painting is done i can get the gloss plot gloss coat applied in preparation for decals and weathering so this is using alclad aqua gloss uh, thinned down with some X20 thinner from Tamiya and applied liberally. <clears throat> My airbrush was sputtering a little bit at this point. That's what kind of why you see the greeny detail, but I was able to get that worked out. 
Um, fortunately, so I don't love doing decals. I, I find it, I find them tedious. Um, so fortunately on this kit, there aren't a lot of decals. It's basically the national insignias, uh, the name special K on the nose, the registration numbers on the tail, and then the wing walkways. And that's about it. No stencil detail. Um, these aircraft carried very few markings, um, by design. So the decaling stage was rather simple, but the ICM decals were nice. They were very thin. Um, in fact, the uh, special K decal, decal here broke on me and I had to work that back together, but <clears throat> they really settled down with some um, solve set and conformed over all the details, especially these, I was concerned these wing walkway decals weren't gonna, were gonna just end up looking like big sheets of plastic painted, you know, plastered over the top of the aircraft, but they really settled down and, and you can see all the nice detail underneath them, so. All right, I apologize there. I realized that I had been talking for nearly an hour straight and my voice was starting to get hoarse and you probably didn't want to hear that. So uh, I am back for a second recording session to carry on. At this point with the weathering process, I am using kind of that same uh, buff color that I use on the interior as a, an oil or a panel line wash here on the dark colors. So this is the black underside and the dark green on the upper side just to help define the panel lines a little bit. And then for the lighter colors, the, the earth and the, the lighter green, I am using the uh, Ammo MIG dark brown for green vehicles wash that I typically use on most of my builds. Just a matter of going through and getting it applied into all the panels. And then once it dries, it can be removed by wiping it away. And pretty straightforward, pretty simple but I think it works pretty good on both the dark and light colored surfaces here to accentuate the panel lines without necessarily like making them, you know, drawing huge amounts of attention to them. And I like it. Um, I, I know that there could be, there is some debate um, in the modeling community about doing panel line washes. And I, I get that some people don't love it. I do. I think it's a, it's a look that I like. So at this point, we can hit everything with a matte coat, tie in all of our uh, painting work, the decal work, and the wash together, and make it ready for the next layer of weathering. Um, at this point, because I will not be doing any more varnishes over the paintwork, I can remove the masking to see how I did, and I am quite pleased at how satisfying it was to pull off this mask work and reveal the lovely um, clear parts. So one of the cool things about the Counter Invader was the different levels of exhaust staining. I saw pictures of them that were really clean and I saw pictures of them that were just absolutely filthy from the exhaust. And I kind of wanted to find somewhere in between. So here I'm just starting with a light gray color to kind of create the base work for the exhaust staining. And another fun thing is just all the different ways that the air flowed around the nacelle to create these really cool staining patterns. It was a lot of fun. I really had a lot of fun doing the uh, exhaust on this. And typically I would have done the exhaust work with oil paints, but I've really been trying to move more towards getting more confident with my airbrushing skills. And exhaust is, is a good way to help practice and boost that confidence. So now I'm using this flat earth color um, to kind of create a little bit more uh, depth to the exhaust staining and uh, kind of some create some color to, to how this looked. And then finally, I'm going to hit it with some black. And, and this is really going to kind of create a, a much more richer tone. And, and I'm also trying to, I'm not trying to do it in a nice steady flow. Um, because the nature of a piston aircraft means that exhaust isn't flowing out at a steady rate. It's, you know, each exhaust stack is, is puffing it out. And so you kind of, it creates this, um, for lack of a better term, a staccato look to it as it's, as it's coming out. And it also builds up in different areas along the aircraft fuselage skin, um, and, and just, and creates this uneven texture and it was it I had a lot of fun playing around with this and these paints are all I've really thinned these paints down drop the pressure down to really um, 
get those on nice and blended. Now I can start doing some oil work and this is really just gonna be concentrated on mainly the upper surfaces of the wings and the fuselage where the ground crew and, and pilots would have been walking around, servicing fuel tanks, servicing the engines, uh, those sorts of things. Um, so if you've seen a lot of my other oil weathering in the past, this is not gonna look unfamiliar. Uh, basically I wet a certain area with um, the with white spirits or, or odorless thinner whatever you prefer to use and then I start applying my oil paints um, by pre-wetting the area with thinner it allows the paint to kind of disperse and blend itself in a little bit so it just I think it makes working with the oil paint a little bit easier um, but I didn't want to go super hard on this just because most of the weathering that I saw on the B-26s was really around the engines. Um, so that's really, really where I wanted to concentrate it. Now I'm using a sponge to apply a little bit of chipping using an aluminum color. The reason why I didn't use like the masking fluid like I used on the interior parts was because I was going to be doing so much handling of the aircraft for painting all of the, the camo pattern and all that stuff and then doing gloss coats over that that I just didn't want to have to deal with having um, the masking fluid on there and accidentally rubbing it off when I didn't want to so it's just easier to apply my chipping um, after the fact so I'm using the sponge here to kind of create the random of randomness effect of the chipping and then when I want to get to more specific areas like these access panels uh, I just use a brush to apply it so that I can be a little bit more controlled on how the chipping is applied um, and and where it, where I want it to go. So really just trying to concentrate on access panels, uh, specific areas where the crew might be moving about on the aircraft. So for the most part, for the pilots to get into the cockpit, they would have to climb up onto the wing here on top of the fuselage and then down into the cockpit which is why the, the walkway strips are there. Um, and so th there would have been generally been a, a fair amount of wear up here, plus ground crew getting up there to service the engine, fuel the aircraft, things like that. Um, you would see the wear there. So now at this point, really at this point, it's just getting everything all assembled now. And there is a lot that goes on to, into the final assembly of the aircraft. Um, you know, getting the wings on is obviously a big point, but, uh, lots of little pieces go into onto this aircraft we can get the fuselage on or the sorry not the fuselage the uh, landing gear fortunately we can apply these um, at this point and they don't have to be installed you know prior uh, it, it's really I really struggle with with kits where you have to install the landing gear uh, earlier on in the build and then you have to deal with masking around them we can get the wheels installed these are 3d printed uh, the kit tires were boring didn't like them so I 3d printed some replacements um, I I debated whether or not I should show you building up and painting all of the ordnance because the ICM kit does come with a really nice set of ordnance but uh, I was already you know we're already pushing an hour in the into the build and it would it would add another 30 minutes showing you how to build up all the ordnance so you get to kind of see the tail end here where I install the remove before flight tags and uh, hopefully you got to get an idea of, of how the ordnance looks. Um, the B-26K did carry a large variety of ordnance so you have lots of options to choose from. This little part here that I'm installing uh, was not included in the kit but on the on the A-26s they found that when trying to bop, drop bombs out of the bomb bay out of the bomb bay, um, the the bombs had actually oftentimes would float back into the bomb bay because of the slipstream, and so they installed these little fins that would pop out whenever the bomb bay doors were open to help disrupt the airflow and make the bombs easier to clean or you know to have a clean drop. And so whenever the bomb bay doors are open, these little these little fins are open, but the ICM does not include them, so I had to scratch build them, and. Uh, so kind of a neat little detail that often gets missed. It's hard to see in a lot of reference pictures because sometimes on modern re restorations, 
they're they're not included because it's just you know one more mechanical part and they don't need them because they're not dropping bombs anymore um, i also scratch built the little crew ladder that pops out of the side of the fuselage as well that's what i'm painting there right now uh, just kind of a fun little detail that it, I've wanted to add. So we get these all painted up and uh, blended into the rest of the fuselage. But I know they're there, and uh, I, I like the, the little splash of red color that they add. We can start getting some ordnance added on. Um, because the ordnance set is supposed to be somewhat of a generic set, they're not actually designed to fit directly to these pylons. And so there's no real clear guide for getting these mounted on you just they just kind of set on so check your references to make sure that you're getting them positioned correctly but this is what i love about the b26 is just the external stores i just think it looks so cool fully loaded you know you got all the guns in the nose all these different weapons on the wings it just looks awesome um, lots of antennas need to be installed uh, lots of aerials and, and radio masts and things like that need to go on uh, additionally, there are lots of radio wires that go on to this, so be aware of that. Um, here is the open hatch in the in the aft compartment. Um, and one thing I couldn't, I can't believe I actually forgot to do earlier was to install the pilot's gun sight. Kind of a important detail there, but fortunately I was able to get that installed in afterwards. As I mentioned before, there are lots of radio wires that go on to this, uh, multiple layers and levels of it, so you kind of have to plan out ahead of time um, which ones you're going to apply when, so that you're not, you know, constantly trying to, you know, having them get in the way and uh, make it annoying here. So these just get super glued on using some nylon thread and uh, side door going on here. This, this was a little tricky to get it to sit on correctly, but I eventually, I, I promise you I did get it stuck on there. And um, finally the, uh, the canopy windows can get installed. I like how these kind of swing open from, this, from the center. It's kind of a neat, unique look. You don't see that on most, on many aircraft. So again, it was just, I wanted to be able to see into the cockpit to be able to uh, really see all that nice detail that's in there. Now, moving on from the airplane, we can start working on the diorama base. So for this, I am using a large 15 inch uh, piece of wood and a fellow Instagrammer designed some 3D printable Marston matting plates. So I printed out a whole bunch of these and the prints weren't perfect, but that's not because the, the file is bad. It's just my printing skills are still you know, in the process of learning how to properly support and orient the part on the build plate. So I used some adhesive spray here to get these tacked down onto the wood. So you can see it's just, it's kind of messy. I sprayed these outside before bringing them back in to install them. But basically you spray the wood and then you spray the bottom sides of the parts that you're gluing, let them set for a little bit, and then you can glue them and it kind of acts like sprayable contact cement um, so I was able to get the whole thing covered here with all of my different pieces making sure to get them all lined up and then it's just a process of uh, letting that dry so I let that cure overnight with some weight on top and then the next day I was able to come through and start cutting now uh, big disclaimer here resin dust is very harmful for you so make sure you're wearing a proper respirator, not just a mask, that's not good enough. Uh, make sure you're wearing a real respirator that will filter out the, the resin dust because you do not want this stuff in your lungs. It is very harmful. Um, this took me a while to kind of work my way around cutting this out. So I have the footage here sped up, but um, it just takes time is really, I mean, it wasn't necessarily difficult work, just uh, time consuming to go around the whole thing, get it trimmed out so it was close to the wood, and then I could come in and uh, finish cleaning it up with a larger sanding bit, um, and then finally some hand sanding. So just uh, work my way around the whole thing here. You can start seeing how much that how much the dust piles up. I ended up having to after this whole ordeal. Um, 
I had to go and completely hose, you know, spray down my uh, my office here with with uh, air gun to to get the dust out with a big box fan in the window pulling it all out out to the outside. It dust got everywhere. Um, but here, so now I'm just using a little bit of sandpaper to kind of clean it up a little bit, remove a lot of the burrs, and uh, there we go. Nice and dusty. Um, I also 3D printed a bunch of parts to go onto the diorama, um, and I will leave links to most of these in the description of the video, uh, should you choose to print your own. Um, some of them are free, some of them you do have to pay for, so just be aware. But um, I will leave the links out for you. And uh, just kind of fun finding little random things that I can print out to populate the, uh, the diorama base. So here we can go ahead and get things painted. So I gave everything a nice good black base coat and giving every, getting everything covered in a steel color. Um, not trying to, you know, give it all nice and even, wanted some variation in there. Um, but overall just wanted a nice solid coat of steel. And then uh, while I had the steel in the paintbrush, I was able to paint some of the accessories and uh, get those ready for additional layers. And then we're going to go in with some dull aluminum, or sorry, dull aluminum, um, and kind of create some highlights. And, and really what I want to do is concentrate along a lot of the joints and then pick out some of the, some panels separately, you know, some maybe newer ones were replacing old ones. And so just wanted to kind of create some variation um, in the overall look of, of the base just to help break it up and not make it look so monotone. Uh, next we're going to do some heavy chipping effects. So the whole thing gets covered in the chipping effects and the reason why I'm doing this is because I wanted to create some some color layers on top and then chip it back down to the bare metal. So here we're just going to do some uh, Air Force Brown. And this is going to be pr painted on pretty lightly, pretty thinned. I didn't want to do a full coverage but this is just basically going to be my, my dust dirt layer as it were so we'll just go ahead and I, I kind of hit some areas harder than others so that they have more concentrated paint on there but pretty straightforward now we're going to activate our chipping fluid using water and a stiff brush and this helps remove some of that brown color so really this is what I'm hoping this is going to do is deposit a lot of that brown color in the recesses and in the cracks and those types of areas and then have some of the more raised exposed areas you know um, exposed back down to that bare metal so we're just going to go ahead and go around the whole thing um, you know doing it doing it stronger in some areas and less strong in other areas just to create some nice tonal variations here so you can kind of see the light catching that metallic color, color underneath and really shining through um, the saying is, if a uh, radial engine isn't dripping oil, that's because it is out of oil. And so radials, they're known for being rather messy. And I wanted to create some kind of fuel oil stains on the ground using this Vallejo color. And then mixing it in with some Agrax Earthshade from Citadel. This is the gloss version, so it kind of helps keep that, um, you know, that slick look to uh, oil or fuel still spills so apply that liberally add it into the drip pans as well and uh, you know because like it like I said if an engine's not dripping oil it's because it's out of oil and you don't want it radial out of oil um, finally we can paint some of the accessories so we're just painting these with some Tamiya yellow getting a good nice solid coat on there took a couple layers um, but I'd rather have a couple thin layers than one overly thick layer. And uh, pretty soon we have a nice and vibrant yellow, soon to be dulled down by weathering. These, uh, these 3D prints took me probably about 10 different tries to get them to print out correctly. They're pretty thin, pretty spindly. and uh, But in the end, I was able to get it. I went through a lot of resin to, to uh, get there, but very happy with the final prints. Um, so once the yellow color is down, then we're going to hit it with some uh, chipping. This is done using a color called German Camouflage Black Brown. This is one of my favorite colors for doing chipping like this. And it's applied with a sponge. 
pretty much all over, you know, hitting all of the edges and, and parts where it would be banging up against something. And uh, here we're just painting up some toolboxes and fire extinguishers. Don't really know if they used red toolboxes boxes out there, but it's kind of like the ubiquitous red toolbox, so it makes sense to me in my mind. <laughs> Uh, fire extinguishers getting painted then we're going to hit everything with a little bit of a wash just to help grime it up and uh, make it look nice and used and abused as they tended to be out there and uh, now we can kind of start composing the final scene here so we get the aircraft on and uh, so here I have the right engine exposed the uh, the left engine is just kind of press fit so if I want to in the future, I can still pull off the engine cowling and show off both engines, but for the diorama's purposes, I only wanted, I'm only going to have one engine exposed. But here it's just a matter of getting everything uh, added in to our scene. And uh, I played around with how I wanted to compose it. And ultimately, this is, this is you know, what I decided on, obviously. But um, it, was, uh, it was kind of fun trying to decide where I wanted to put everything, how much I wanted to put stuff in. This little ladder I actually ended up scratch building and uh, just from plastic just to have something for the crew to get into in the, the back compartment. Got some of these uh, fuel hoses here. Uh, finally, the pilot's helmet just sitting on the canopy there. And then my figures. So this is a collection of figures from ICM and some old monogram figures. Now, I do not purport myself to be a figure painter in any stretch of the imagination. And I'm even worse trying to film myself painting figures. So I apologize that I don't have footage of that. But uh, it would kind of just be a waste of your time. Because I am I just I struggle with trying to film well painting figures. But we got our mechanics over there working on the engine. And then we're going to have our pilots over here, you know, doing a little pre-flight prep talk, pep talk or whatever. And uh, here we go. Final reveal. So, final thoughts on this build is this was a fantastic build, and I loved every second of it. ICM has a great kit on their hands. Out of the box, it will build up a great-looking B-26. You definitely don't need to do all the work that I put into detailing the interior. It, it will build up nice. It has everything that it needs to look like a great B-26. There are a few things that I would recommend doing, though. Uh, the very least is replacing the nose so that it's more accurate, as well as replacing the wheels, the tires. Uh, the kit tires are not very good. Other than that, you can build out of the box and make it look good. Uh, I did want to take it the extra mile because I, I, I intended from the start to build this diorama scene, and um, I had fun playing around with the 3D printer, printing out all these accessories. I think there's going to be a big future in self, you know, doing printing like this for um, diorama accessories and aircraft accessories, and uh, I I definitely plan on building all of the other versions of the A26 that are available, and I know there's a lot of versions, so um, definitely look for more of those in the future, but if you've made it this far in the video, I know it was a long video, thank you so much for watching, I really appreciate the support. Um, if you're not already subscribed, please consider subscribing and uh, so you can get more content like this. And I need to do a huge shout out to my patrons for supporting this channel and making it possible for me to bring you content like this. And I am looking forward to doing more. So thank you. I hope you enjoyed the video. Let me know what you think down below and we'll see you on the, see you on the next one.